class so I can record it. Okay. The way the United States define employment is like this. According to the United States, if you work for at least two hours a week and you get paid, you are not unemployed. Or if you work for a family business for 10 hours a week, even if you, I said 10 or 15, we'll, we'll, I'll, I'll give you the number of them. Yeah, if you work for a family business, I think it's 15 hours. If you work for a family business for 15 hours a week, and even if you don't get paid, you're not unemployed. So according to them, you are working hours. Your mom and dad had a little store, and uh, you decide to go ahead and help them a day and a half there, right? And even if they don't pay you, according to them, you're not unemployed. That means that you are employed. What really blows my mind is the way they define somebody employed. It only requires two hours of pay per week, and you are classified as employed. So how about to be unemployed? If I tell you I am unemployed, what is being unemployed means? To be unemployed, according to the United States, is this. You have to be actively, well, you have to be able and willing and actively seeking employment. You have to be able, capable, willing, and actively seeking employment. In other words, if you're not looking for a job, you are not unemployed. Look at some of you, look at some of you. Some of you are college students. You say, I'm not working. Yeah, you're not working, right? But you're not looking for a job. So then you are not unemployed. Because to be unemployed, the key phrase is, you have to be actively seeking employment. You have to actively seek an employment, okay? So now let me tell you how we divide the population of our states, okay? So I'm gonna start by just giving my own notes. And then we look at the PowerPoints. Okay. In the United States, we have a population of about 326 million people. But out of these 326 million people, not everybody works. So we divide individuals into part of the labor force and not in the labor force. Okay. That's the way we define the people in the labor force. In the United States, it's about 157 million people that they are actually part of the labor force. So as you can see, about 50% of the US population actually work, and the other 50% of the population in the United States is not classified as the labor force. So now, how do they determine the labor force? How do they determine the people that they are actually able and capable to work? And it goes like this. They look at the population, and to the population, they subtract those people over the age of 65. They subtract those people under the age of 16. They subtract people in the armed forces. Uh, people in the military. And then they subtract also people uh, in institutions. Well, actually, it's not armed forces. It's actually, they subtract people in, the, in institutions. and armed forces. You know, people in the military and people that they are in the hospitals or mental asylums or universities, right? You know, they are in institutions. And then they also subtract, uh, we used to call them housewives, but now that's not an acceptable term. We used to call them homemakers. So we subtract the homemakers. The homemakers, people that stay at house, taking care of children, right? So then when we subtract from the 326 million people, people, that they are over 65, people under the age of 16, uh, people in institutions and the armed forces, and people that we classify as homemakers, then we end up with a number of about 157 million. So then 157 million people is people that we classify people in the labor force. These are the ones that are actually able, capable, and willing to work. So then from these 157 million, you know, these are the people that work or they're looking for job, right? So then when we're talking about, for example, if we have a 3% unemployment rate, we're talking about 3% or this number. 
or this number. So for example, at this point, the unemployment rate is about 20%, a little bit more than 20%. So then that means out of 157 million, we have about 30 million people, 20, you know, a little bit more than 30 million, 30 million people that they're actually not working today. They're actively seeking employment. So as you can see, from the labor force of 157 million, you subtract 30 million, so we only have about 127 million people working and 30 million people are actually looking for a job. So that's 20% of 157 million. So when you, every time you look about the numbers of unemployment, we're talking about the number of people that they are not working, but they're actively seeking employment, that they are part of the labor force. So the percentage is the percentage of the people in the labor force. Okay? Very simple, okay, very simple. So this is, that's the way we classify people that they actually employ and unemployed, okay? So now let me share my screen right here, and let's go over the PowerPoint slides. This is chapter six, okay? So on this chapter, we're going to try to understand about what unemployment is, the way we measure unemployment, what is the cost, of unemployment, the classifications of unemployment, and what do we mean when we say the economy is at full employment, okay? We already know that unemployment is a very big problem. As a matter of fact, it's one of the two major macroeconomic problems. Now we have inflation and unemployment, right? And then we also have a goal of achieving economic growth. So then the question is, when is a person unemployed? And the definition, well, when is a person unemployed, right? What are the costs of being unemployed? And then why is it a, a goal to have full employment, okay? So in the United States, again, we divide the population into people in the labor force and people out of the labor force. So the people in the labor force are all persons age 16 and over who are either employed or actively seeking, seeking work. And again, this is, that's the key you have to actively seeking work, and then you'll be classified as part of the labor force. But if you're not looking for a job, right, or you're not working, then you're out of the labor force. My grandmother, my grandfather, my dad, they're not part of the labor force. So then we look at the population, and then we, we divide them into two groups, the out of the labor force and in the labor force. And I already told you that uh, the United States, this, it's about 50%. In other words, the population is divided about 50%. 50% of the population, they are children and older people and people going to universities or people incarcerated or people, you know, in the military. And then the labor force are the people that are actually working and looking for jobs. So then after that, then we divide the labor force into two subcategories, either those that they are employed and those that they are unemployed. Okay? Very simple process. So again, the labor force compromise about half of the population. And this labor force has actually more than doubled since the 1960s. Now, again, think about it. In 1960s, uh, the labor force was about 75 million people. So in the last 40 years, 50 years, well, now 60, right? The last 60 years, the population has doubled. Now, why has the population in the labor force has actually increased? And the reason is because now for the first time, you know, in history, we have a large participation of females in the labor force. Before the 1960s, before the 1960s, it was uncommon for ladies, you know, to work. It was uncommon for mom to go to work. You know, it was mostly, you know, uh, males that used to go to work. Uh, but after the 1960s, after World War II, in which we were in despair to find more workers, uh, females came into the labor force, and then we realized that they are just as productive as male. So then females begin to get some freedom, and they begin to feel comfortable being in the part of the labor force. And today, if we look at the labor force, the labor force is comprised about 51, 49%, you know, male females. You know, as a matter of fact, if you look at the participation ratio by gender, females participate in the labor force at a higher rate than males which is very interesting, right? In other words, females like to work and they usually tend to be employed, okay? So then what is the impact of this growth of the population or the labor force? 
well, if we have more people working, then these people are able to produce more. So the impact of the labor force in the United States has been that it has actually increased the production possibility frontier, which simply means that as a result of this 70 million women that we have in the labor market, now they're able to produce more. Now think about countries in which they don't actually uh, give freedoms for females to work, like most of the Eastern countries. Think about, for example, countries like, for example, in uh, uh, Saudi Arabia, in which females cannot work, or if they work, it's very limited places where they can work. Look at the waste of the resources that we are not utilizing. Right? In countries in the Middle East, females cannot even drive. They cannot even go to the store by themselves. They cannot make any decisions. Right? They, are, according to them, they are just created by God to have children right? and to be a second-class citizens. So then if we have a second-class citizen that they are not producing, then as you can see, then the economy is never going to be able to produce at the most efficient method. They are never going to be actually to be successful. They will always be underproducing they always will be making less than what they are capable. Okay, so again, this is the impact of the labor force. Now, the, pop, the labor force has actually increased in the United States for a couple of reasons. One of them is because we simply, you know, the population is growing. However, the population growth in the United States has been very, very, very small. I think the population growth in the United States is about 1%. Right, on the other hand, we have a large number of immigrants that come into the United States. So then our labor force has increased dramatically, right, dramatically, not only because of the population growth, but also because of the immigrants, <clears throat> excuse me, that have come into the labor market. Now, if you look at the United States, for example, you look at certain industries, there's in certain industries that they are highly, highly populated, highly populated by immigrants. I mean, we always think as immigrants, people working, you know, in low-skilled jobs. I mean, we think about immigrants, for example, all these Mexicans, all these Hispanic individuals working mowing yards or working in the construction, in the, in the construction building. But in reality, we have a lot of immigrants that they actually making big contributions in the United States that they actually in high-skilled jobs. Think of, for example, uh, these uh, Silicon Silicon Valley. Think about, you know. Think about, for example, about the thousands, the thousands of scientists and individuals in the IT programs working for Google and for Facebook and for, and most of these are Asian individuals working for these high tech companies, right? Asian and Indians. Now, this is going to blow your mind, but this is just to give you an idea about the impact that immigration has had in the United States. In the medical field, in the medical field here in the United States, talking about general practitioners, just MDs, you know, the guy that you go and look in the emergency room, general practitioners, 40% of all medical doctors in the United States are from India. Now think about that for a second. 40% of all medical doctors in the United States are actually from India. Now, why is that the case? Well, because in India, it's a very large population, I don't know if you know this, but in India, you know, all the education is in English. <clears throat> so when the individuals go to a university to graduate, you know, they use the same textbook that we use in the United States. So then these medical doctors graduate from Indian universities and they have studied all the medical books in the United States. In the United States, we have a problem in rural areas. Medical doctors go to medical school because they want to make money. You don't make money by working in little towns like Cleveland, Tennessee, or Toro Town, Tennessee, or Dog Town, Tennessee, you know, when we have, you know, a thousand people. So nobody in the right mind is going to go and open a practice in those little cities. So there are some cities in the United States in which the closest doctor will be, let's say, 100 miles away. So we know that's a problem. So then as a result of this, the United States government has actually give working visas to doctors to come to the United States. They give them a resident card and they come and they have to make a contract. And the contract is that they're going to practice two years 
in a place that the United States is going to assign them. The United States say, hey, we need you in this part of the country. You know, if you're willing to go work there for two years. Then after that, you get your residency and then you can move anywhere in the country. Here in Cleveland, where I live in my neighborhood, three houses up from me, we have a young guy that moved here. And he was a medical doctor. He was actually from Colombia, right? And he was on the DAP program. He was actually operating in Turtle Town, Tennessee. So he had to go to Turtle Town, Tennessee. And he did that for two years, right? After he did his assignment, you know, the first thing he did is move to Chattanooga. And now he has a practice in Chattanooga. He's working at, uh, you know, at uh, one of the big hospitals in Chattanooga. <clears throat> but for two years, he was working in a little health clinic in Turtle Town, Tennessee. And across the United States, in every little town, we have doctors. And chances are these doctors are going to be a Chinese or Indian guys that they are here, right? Because they are here in, the, in, in, the, in, the, in that uh, business. Uh, when we look at the NASA, NASA employees, look about the brightest of the brightest. 60% of all NASA employees are from India, right? When we look at you know, the, the Silicon Valley, the majority of, these, of the workers are foreigners. We have Indians and Asian individuals working. So again, all this high level of immigration uh, has actually helped our economy to actually to expand. And that has created a problem for a lot of nations. And for some nations, this has created a program of what's called brain drain. Brain drain simply means that the smartest people in your country are going to leave your country. Countries like, for example, like Nigeria, countries like Ghana. I mean, some of you have probably students Ali or work with students Ali that they're from Nigeria or students from Nepal, right? These kids come to the United States, they study, and their dream is, I don't want to go back to Nepal. I don't want to go back to Nigeria. You know, because over there, they are not going to compensate me or they're not going to pay me as much as they pay me in the United States. In addition to that, the instability and the insecurity and the freedom are not there. So then they want to stay here. And because they have uh, education, it's very easy for them to get a working permit. Even at Lee, think about it. Even at Lee, we have individuals that they are not from the United States, that they are teaching here on the working visas. In the business department, not too long ago, we used to have an accounting professor by the name of, uh, 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 what's the name of the young girl? Uh, 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 his name, I'm trying to remember the name. It's a young girl, she was here from the Bahamas, right? And once she got the residency, well, she moved and began to teach accountancy in another, her, her last name was Hart. Anybody took a class with her? Her last name was Hart, you know? And again, she was with us for a couple of years and while she got her residency, she moved and she's now in Knoxville. We had a professor from, Niger from Nigeria in our department teaching finance. And once he got his visa, he's now in Boston College. You know, I'm talking about a very bright guy, qualified. We don't know how we attracted here. Well, we know why. We attracted him because he was desperate to get a job to come into the United States. Once he got here, then he moved to a big top university in the nation. And that's exactly what is happening. So then, the United States expansion has been as a result of population growth, high participation ratio of females, and also the high volume of immigration that has come into the United States. Okay, so when we try to stop immigration to the United States, what we're actually doing, we are stopping the brightest of the brightest, in most cases, to come here into the United States. Okay, and you can make a big contribution if you have specific skills. So if you look at all the books, at all the books, all countries allow immigration. All countries allow immigration. And all countries want the best of the best to come and work on their nations. And then in addition to that, then countries also have the problem of illegal immigration. All countries of the world have problems with people trying to come and work for them. Why? Because there's always worse, somebody worse than you. Here we have people from Mexico coming to the United States. Why? They have very close proximity. They can cross the border. They know they're going to have a better paying job. But if you go to countries like Argentina, you know, you, they have people from Paraguay and Uruguay being there. You go to Chile, they have people from Costa Rica, they have people from 
you know, Bolivia going there. You go to Bolivia, you have people from, from China, you know, going there as illegal immigrants working in Bolivia. And the same thing goes in every country. You go to England and they have a lot of African people. You go to Italy, they have a lot of people from, you know, again, from, a, a, from across the Mediterranean, you know, working there illegally. And, and that's, that's part of, you know, the economies. That's part of the economies, okay? So, any questions or comments? Okay, so then the labor force has increased dramatically as a result of immigration, right? And also population growth. Now, at this point, you know, there's about 2 million new entrants into the market. So then the United States has been very successful in creating about 2 million new jobs for this expanding labor force. Again, historically, our labor force has expanded by about 2 million you know, openings every single year. Okay, so that's the employment. So now let's talk about being unemployed. Okay, what, is, what does it mean to be unemployed? Well, to be unemployed simply means that you're not able to find a job. So unemployment is the inability of the labor force to be able to find a job, right? And again, if we have people unemployed, then the economy is producing inside the frontier. They are being inefficient. If we have 30 million people today out of work, which is a little bit more than that, 30 million, think about this. How many houses can 30 million people make if we were to put them to make houses? Or how about if we were to put them there to make bridges? Or how about there to build schools or to build highways or to build roads or to build airplanes? 30 million people is larger than the population of many, many countries. So when 30 million dollars, I'm sorry, when 30 million people are not being employed, we are underutilizing our labor force. So that is bad, not only for them, but it's also bad for the economy. It's bad for the economy today, and it's bad for the economy in the future. Now, can any of you will try to tell me why do you believe having people unemployed is bad for the economy in the future? I mean, you know why it's bad today, right? Because they are not producing what they are capable of producing. But why it will also be bad in the future? Come on, guys, let's have some discussion. What did it do to you? I don't know if this is more a now or future kind of effect, but there's less spending going on when people are unemployed. So the market can become more stagnant. Okay. So in other words, the actions that we take today, because these people don't have the money to buy, is affecting the companies, and probably some of the companies are going to disappear. And in the future, we're going to have less companies. I mean, think about what is happening today. JC Penney declared bankruptcy. Why? Because nobody's buying. Right? In uh, what's that? Old Navy declared bankruptcy. In uh, Neiman Marcos declared bankruptcy. Right? In uh, what else? Any other companies that you know that declare bankruptcy? A couple of air, small, small airlines have declared bankruptcy. So then those companies are going to disappear. Okay. Anybody else? How would you unemployed, you might, you might not have as many kids because you can't provide for them, which then takes out a future life force, maybe. Okay. Uh, for some reason, your voice went in and out. Can you explain that again? So if you're unemployed and you don't have Sorry, this is my internet's unstable. I was not able to hear you. If you're unemployed, um, then you won't be able to have as much money to be able to have as many children to provide for. So then that takes out of the future labor force. Okay. Okay. You, you become a little bit more reserved on what you're going to do. Yeah. So as you can see, the impact of unemployment is not only now, but it's also in the future. One of the, or the, or the main impacts of having people unemployed is this. When you're unemployed, you're not developing skills. You're not getting experience. You're not learning how to be more efficient. You're not practicing whatever you were making. So then when you find a job, it's going to take some time to catch up right, on that experience. So then the economy in the future is going to be less productive because we have people that they are learning how to do things. Because the unemployed people are probably going to move into another job in which they don't have a lot of experience and they're going to have to learn how to be good at that job. Or simply you just, 
you just forgot about how to do things. Think about, for example, if a young person is a, an IT guy and he cannot find a job for a year. I mean, technology changes every six months. Every six months, technology changes. So this guy that is out of work, working for a company, probably he's not gonna be able to know exactly what to do. You know, or he's not going to be very efficient if he's not up to date on what's going on on these technological changes, okay? So that's some of the impacts of technology. I'm sorry, of unemployment, okay? So in addition to this, studies have been made to try to figure out exactly what is the impact in the economy when we have people out of work. There was an economist by the name of Arthur Okuns, and Arthur Okuns, he made a 100-year study, right, a longitude study to try to figure out the correlation or the relationship between unemployment and economic growth. And this is what he was able to discover, that for every 1% increase in unemployment, GDP is going to be affected by 2% in an opposite direction. So if unemployment increased by 1%, the economy is going to contract by 2%. Okay, that's scary. Because think about this, but how much has the unemployment, but how much has the unemployment increased in the last five weeks? Anybody remember before the spring break, when you went there, what was the unemployment rate? The unemployment rate. Was it right? close to like 4%? You are, you are correct, Melody. It was actually, the unemployment rate was 3.9%, the lowest unemployment rate that we had ever had in the United States in the last 50 years. In other words, everybody was working at 3.9% unemployment rate. It was actually below a natural level of unemployment, and I'll explain what that means in a minute. So now we went from 4% to 20%, from 4 to 20%. So as you can see, the unemployment rate has increased by 16%. So then if we have a 16% unemployment that has the potential of decreasing the economy by 16 times two is 32. I mean, that will be a nightmare if this becomes reality, that the economy will contract by 32%. But guess what? It has actually contracted by about 30% in this quarter, the level of output, okay? So one of the good things about it is that this unemployment has not been the whole year. And that's why we say, okay, now we have been suffering for six weeks or two months, and now we need to put these people back to work because we cannot allow the economy to contract by 36% for the whole year. So that's why the government, the present administration is desperately out there trying to tell people, hey, go back to work, everything will be okay, right? And the reason is because of the impact that it has in the economy, okay? So Ockham's law simply say that a 1% change in unemployment causes a 2% decrease in GDP. So then when are you unemployed? Well, you're unemployed if you're not working, but you are actively, and that's the key word. You have to be actively seeking work. If you're not actively seeking work, then you cannot be counted as unemployed. So then when we talk about the unemployment rate, that's the proportion of the labor force that is not employed. All right, so we're looking at the number of unemployed people, we divide that by the labor force, and that will give me my unemployment rate. For example, in 2010, when we have a very high level of unemployment, there were 14 million out of work. The labor force was 153 million, so 14 million divided by 153, so it's not about 9.6. So today, somebody help me with your Calculator. Today we have about 33 million people unemployed. 33 million people unemployed. And we have a labor force of about 157 million. So I'll just go 33 divided by 157. Anybody? 33 divided by 157. About 21%. About 21% unemployment. Um, Dr. Hosto? Yes. 
I have a question. Us. Okay, sorry. So this goes back to what you said before. I'm slightly confused about how if there's a 1% increase in unemployment, it's a 2% decrease in GDP. Yeah. Since I think since last class we talked about how GDP is equal to the national income. Yeah. So I would have thought that they'd be equal rather than double. So why is that? Uh, okay. Let me see if I understand your question. You say that you're a little bit confused because you say that GDP and income are the same. Okay. Let, let, me, let me see if I, can, if, if I can answer your question. At this point, we have 30 million people out of work. So the level of unemployment has increased by, what is it, 16%? We used to have four, now we are 20, so by 16%. So the economy, we have 16% of the people that they were working that have lost their jobs. So then that's going to have an impact on economic growth at a rate of 2% times every 1% change. So it will be 32%. So then the economy has contracted by 32% which in turn, because the economy has contracted by 32%, that means that the income of households have decreased by the same amount, which simply means that people now have 32% less money than before this incident, right? Because they are not producing and production equals to income. So that's why the United States government say, okay, at this point, we cannot produce because of this coronavirus. So then what we will do, we artificially, artificially create some phantom money, right? Or we bring money from other economies, the United States borrow money, and then we give this money to the people. And then if we give this money to the people, then individuals are going to begin to buy. And when they buy, they're going to begin to buy the inventories that have already been produced. And the economy will begin to bounce back. Did that, did that answer your question? Um, sort of. So could you also say then with the Oaken's law yeah. that a 1% increase in unemployment results in a 2% decrease in national income? Could you say that also yes. then? Yes. Yes. Okay. Because, because GDP and national income is the same. Right. So, okay. so the, that, yeah, that's exactly the, the problem that we have with unemployment. Unemployment is an evil. It's an evil situation because it affects not only the individual that is actually unemployed, but it actually affects all the individuals around that individual. Now think about how, how having my neighbor out of work is going to affect me. Well, it affects you because your neighbor is going to have some type of government aid. So either the government is going to tax me to give transfer payments to the unemployed individuals, right? Or the government is going to borrow money to be able to pay the unemployed individual. And then eventually I, me, you, I want to have to pay for that money that we borrow to give to that people that was unemployed during that period of time. Okay. So again, unemployment has a lot of negative consequences and we're going to go that in, in a minute, you know, all the impacts of unemployment. Any other question? Melody, that's pretty good, pretty good question. And I do enjoy when you ask questions and you interact with the class, okay? So the way we measure unemployment rates is by looking at the number of people out of work divided by the labor force, and that will give you the number, okay? So we don't have to do this because we already work. Now, does unemployment hit everyone the same? And the answer is no. No, not everybody is affected by unemployment at the same rate. For example, we know that men have a higher rate of unemployment than females, right? In other words, for some reason, you no know, men have a little bit higher unemployment rate than females. Blacks and Hispanics have higher rates of unemployment than whites. I mean, why is that the case? Well, it can be a lot of reasons. It can be probably that the companies owned by whites discriminate against Blacks and Hispanics, right? That can be one explanation. Another explanation can be that probably most of the companies are in suburbia or they're outside the big cities. So then Blacks and Hispanics that live inside the big cities, in the inner cities, 
you know, they don't have a way of transportation to go out and look for a job in a company that is 20 miles outside the city or 10 miles outside the city, or even two miles outside the city because the boss do not go to that company. So if you don't have a car, you cannot find a job at an Amazon warehouse, for example. Now think about it for a second. I mean, here in, in Cleveland, for example, we have an Amazon plant. The Amazon plant is here in Charleston, Tennessee. It's actually two miles from a house. Now look at all the number of probably individuals that live in Cleveland, young guys, you know, that they're looking for a job. But they don't have a car. And because they don't have a car, they're not going to be able to secure employment. And even if they secure employment, eventually they're going to get fired because their ride is not going to be able to continue bringing them every single day to work. So then Blacks and Hispanics tend to have higher rates of unemployment. The less educated people also have higher rates of unemployment. Why? Well, because there's a lot of them and they're easy to replace. On the other hand, if you have a very high education or you have a very specific skill, then the company cannot afford to let you go because it's gonna be hard to replace you. So doctors and nurses and engineers and architects and college professors have higher rate, I'm sorry, lower rates of unemployment than probably, uh, I don't know, plumbers, right? Or, you know, carpenters and things like that, okay? Teenagers also have higher rates of unemployment than older people, right? And the reason is because companies, when they're going to hire people, they prefer to hire people that they believe are going to be more reliable or people that probably are going to be there for a longer term. We know that teenagers are only looking for a job to make a buck. They only want a job to buy the burgers and to pay for the car insurance in the meantime while they're going to school, just to go out and watch the movies, take the boyfriend or the girlfriend out to the movies. Right, so as a result of this, then the companies think twice before they hire a teenager, right? So the question is, how long usually are people is out of work? Well, the answer is depends on how the economy is doing. For example, today that the economy is in a recession, well, we expect that these people are going to be out of work for a longer period of time. On the other hand, when the economy is doing good, it will be very easy for an individual to actually find employment. So then when the economy is growing, both the unemployment rate and the duration actually decreases. When the economy is stagnating, then this is going to take a little bit longer, right? So it's not easy to find a job. For example, today, it will be very hard to find a job in any field, in any field. Why? Because companies now are not hiring. They just go into an automatic freeze. And the reason is because of this, most companies have moved their workers to work out of the house. So most people are already working out of the house. So companies at this point, they cannot afford to have interviews and then train these people how to operate whatever they're operating, you know, or they're doing out of their house. So those companies, all companies, all companies are, are a freeze. Okay, so now let's look about the reasons of why some people are out of work, okay? Reasons for unemployment. Well, most of the people that they are unemployed, they are unemployed because they lost their job. 63% of all unemployed people are out of work, not because they wanted to be out of work, simply because they lost their job. They were fired or they just simply were laid off, right? 23% of all the people unemployed, they are re-entrants. And re-entrants is the people that come back right into the labor market after being out of the labor market uh, for example a young woman you know was working then she got married and then she decided to stay at home and become a mother once the kids are going back to elementary school then this person say oh i think now i can go ahead and work part time or now i can go ahead and, and work because my kids is already a teenager so those are the re-entrants right and then we have about eight percent of the people that they are people like you, that they just graduated from college and now for the first time they're going to enter the market and looking for a full-time job in the field in which they have studied. So about 8%, right? And then we have about 6% of the people that they're unemployed simply because they hate their jobs. You know, job leavers, I like the hell with this. You know, I'm gonna go someplace else. You know, I don't like my boss, I don't like what I'm doing. I'm gonna move to California. So it's about 6%. 
So what it's simply telling you is that the majority of the people are out of work not because they want to be out of work. They are out of work because of the circumstances, in most cases, simply because they were let go, okay? So in addition to people that we actually have unemployed, then we have what is called discouraged workers. And the discouraged workers are the people that they actually just have given up. They have just given up in seeking employment. Well, once you give up in looking for a job, you're no longer counted as part of the labor, labor force. So we are not going to count you as unemployed. If you, are, you just gave up, okay, you become a ghost, right? We are not going to, to use you in government reports, right? They drop out of the labor force, so they are no longer counted in unemployment statistics. Okay, so this is the discouraged workers. Now, in addition to the discouraged workers, then we have the underemployed. And the underemployed is people who they're actually working, but they are working doing something below their capacities. For example, a college graduate, let's say a guy like you, you know, that have a, let's say, a, a bachelor's degree in business, and you are not able to find a job, but at this point, you just need to do something and you become a waiter or you become a waitress. I mean, you're working, but you are underemployed because you are at a job in which your skills are not being utilized, right? And again, that's the underemployed. I remember my son, my son, has an, he studied English, and then after that, he went and got a master's degree in English literature. I used to discourage him. I said, I mean, what are you gonna waste your time? What do you wanna do with an English major? You know, I mean, literally, I tried to discourage him, but that's what he loved. So after he finished his master's degree in English literature, he graduated with honors, you know, from the University of Tennessee, you know, and also graduated from honors from Lee University. You know, he was working at O'Charlie's as a waiter. You know, and to me, that was discouraged. Look at this young boy. He went to school for six years as a master's degree. You know, my older boy, he listened to my advice and he went to business, right? And now he's doing really good on whatever he's doing. And my other boy, that he was following his passion, now his wedding tables are our charities. So he was underemployed. However, after that, you know, he was able to find another job and he is now, you know, the, the what is it called? He's like a writer or editor for Volkswagen Corporation. He's, he's the one that published the newspaper for Volkswagen Corporation. So he has a very good job now, specifically on his field, almost like a director of communic internal communications. A Volkswagen. So, but for many years, for about two years of his life, he was underemployed, right? And that's what being underemployed is. So then the underemployed, they are actually working, so they account as employed. Right? So being unemployed has a lot of cost. It has a lot of cost. And we're going to try to understand what is the human cost of being unemployed, okay? So it is 11, I'm sorry, it's 11 of five, so let's go ahead and have uh, 15 minutes. Let's be back at 11, let's be back at 11.20, okay? So we have a break. We'll be back at 11.20, it's about 12 minutes break, okay? Everybody follow me? Let's take a break, we'll be back. It's 11.08, let's be back at 11.20, okay? Go and feed your cat.
So, what is some of the human cost of being unemployed? I mean, who suffers? Well, as you already know, I already told you, we already tried to explain the economic cost of unemployment, you know, how it impacted, you know, the economy, economic growth, and things like that. But in addition to the economic impact, we also have actually human cost. Think about, for example, the pain that individuals are experiencing today as a result of not being able to pay for their houses or the fear that they're going to uh, lose their cars or the fear that they're going to be evicted from the apartment they're actually renting. So then the human cost is that individuals lose income. And when they lose income, they're actually going to go through a lot of social stress. Right? In addition to the loss of stress, individuals also lose confidence. They simply begin to question themselves. I may I might unemployed because I am just dumb or I just don't have what the companies require or they fire me because they don't like me or they fire me because they don't like my personality or they fire me because so people begin to think of themselves in a negative way. Now, to, in some cases, the stress goes that when individuals are actually unemployed, individuals actually kill themselves. The loss of life. And this is a very serious situation. Not only here in the United States, but in other countries, this is a very, very, very hard situation. For example, in the country of Japan, in the country of Japan, Japanese individuals, historically, they knew that once you are employed for the company, you're gonna be working for that company for life. The company will never fire a worker. The company will hire an individual. If that individual is not doing his job, that individual will be reassigned to another area of the company, but that individual will never be fired. Today, for the first time, Japanese people are actually experiencing you know, the situation that they're actually being laid off, they're actually being fired simply because the companies are not doing good. So these individuals begin to go to a lot of social stress, and some individuals simply say, I cannot deal with this issue, and they're actually taking their lives. As a matter of fact, if you go to Japan, there's a park in the center of Japan or Tokyo, just like New York City. Uh, anybody remember, has ever heard about this? What's the name of that, of that park? See, it's now nicknamed Suicide, Suicide Park because every night in that park, two Japanese people kill themselves. It's a, it's a forest, a big park, and people go, and every night two people kill themselves. It got to the point now because the government now has signs throughout the park and say, hey, don't kill yourself. Let us know what's going on. We will try to help you. You need to understand that the Japanese have a different culture than us and different religions. We believe in Christianity, life is sacred. And the Japanese, they actually believe in reincarnation. So to them is, look, if I kill myself, I'm doing an honor to my family. I mean, you have seen films and have read about the Japanese soldiers during World War II in which they will become Kamasaki pilots and they will kill themselves. Right? Because to them, killing yourself for a specific cause is an honor that you bring into your family and God is going to compensate you by bringing you back into life in another body. So to these people, when they say, I cannot provide for my children, I'm just going to go ahead and kill myself. Probably my life insurance will take care of my kids and I'm doing an honorable thing. So individuals actually kill themselves and that creates a very hard situation uh, for, for families. So again, this is the human cost of unemployment. Uh, there was a study made in, I believe it was in uh, Norway, to try to figure out exactly what is the impact in the health of individuals when individuals are going to a lot of stress, specifically for the, if they are unemployed. And according, I'm trying to recall the exact numbers, but it goes something like this. For every one year of unemployment, for every one year of unemployment, individuals cut their lifespan by two years. Now, when individuals are for one year looking, employing, looking for a job and they cannot find it, that creates so much thing in their body, so much stress, that the lifespan of those individuals tend to be cut by two years. So as you can see, there's a human cost of unemployment. So now when we talk about individuals or that we have full employment, full employment is not the same as having zero unemployment. You need to understand that when we say the economy is at full employment, that does not mean that everybody is working. So, first of all, let me explain to you the different classifications of unemployment. There are four categories of unemployment, okay? We have the seasonal unemployed. These are the people that they are out of work because of the seasons of the year. 
carpenters don't have work during winter months. And ski instructors don't have a job during the summer months, right? Seasonal unemployment. Then we have the frictional unemployed. And the frictional unemployed is the people out of work for short periods of time. They're out of work because they're looking for another job. They have an education or they have skills and there are jobs available. It's just going to take time for them to find each other. Will be like, for example, some of you, you got there from college, right? You have a college education. You can make a big contribution to the company. There's a company out there looking for somebody like you, but it's gonna take time between you find that job and you match and start working for the company. So that's a frictional unemployed. And then we have the structural unemployed. The structural unemployed is the people that they out of work simply because they have no skills or the skills that they have are no longer in need. I mean, I remember, for example, when I was a young boy, I used to go with my father to his work. And my father's job was to repair mattresses. Now, I don't know if you know this, but mattresses have springs. And once you use it for a long time, you know, some of the springs, especially where people sleep in the same uh, place, on the same position, you know, the, the springs tend to, you know, just simply lost the elasticity. So my father used to, I remember this as a child, he would go to a house and uh, with a little knife, he will cut the, you know, the side of the mattress and he literally take out the, you know, the foam and things like that. And he will repair the, the springs and then he will go put the things back and then he, by, by hand, he will sew the mattress back together. People used to repair the mattress. Now people don't do that anymore. So then the skill that my father has for repairing mattress is no longer on need. So then people like my father you know, will never have a job in the, same, in, the same, in the same market, right? So that's a structural unemployed. And then we have the cyclical unemployed. So the cyclical unemployed is the people that they're actually out of work because of the cycles of the economy. Because of the cycles of the economy. Okay, so when the economy is going to a recession, unemployment begins to increase. And when the economy is going into a growth, the economy begin to expand and unemployment begin to decrease. So let me see if I can remember this. Okay. So, What is the different types of unemployment? We have the seasonal unemployed, people out of work because of the seasons of the year. We have the frictional unemployed, people out of work for short periods of time while they find a job. We have the structural unemployed, people that have lost the skills. And then we have the cyclical unemployed, people that they are out of job because of the cycles of the economy. As you already know, the economy expands, but the expansion of the economy is never you know, going up, up and up. It goes through cycles. It goes through periods of, you know, expansion. It reach a peak. It goes to a recession. It goes to a, a trial. Then it go back to a recovery and things like this. So the economy moves through cycles up and down. And as the economy is moving up in cycles, unemployment moves in opposite directions. When the economy is expanding, unemployment begins to decrease. When the economy begins to contract, unemployment begins to increase. When the economy is at its lowest level, like now, unemployment is at the highest level, then when the economy begins to go into, you know, uh, recuperation, then the unemployment begins to decrease. And that's the cyclical unemployment. So now, remember this. It is natural to have people out of work because of the seasons of the year. It is natural to have people out of work simply because they are looking for a better job. It is natural to have people out of work simply because they have no skills. However, this is not natural. So then the cyclical unemployment, we classify that as the evil unemployment. It's the unemployment that we are really, really concerned because it's people out of work because the economy is moving in a way that is negative towards them. Like now, the unemployment has increased from 4% you know, to uh, 20%. So this number of 16% increase in unemployment has been as a result that the economy is going into a contraction. That's cyclical unemployment and that's the evil type of unemployment so if we tell you that the economy is a full employment keep this in mind 
it is natural to have people out of work because of these reasons. So anywhere between four and six and a half percent is a natural rate of unemployment. In other words, if we have between four and six and a half percent, the economy is doing good. Now think about this, before your spring break, the unemployment was about 3.8, 3.9%. Which simply means that we have a rate of unemployment that was below the natural rate of unemployment. Right? So in other words, this was not natural. It was not natural. So now, what is wrong with having an unemployment so low of 3.8? Well, before your spring break, when the unemployment was at 3.8, companies were having difficulties finding the right employees. And the, on, the only way they were able to find workers is by paying bonus or higher salaries to attract individuals from other companies. So then low levels of unemployment creates inflation because it's now more expensive for companies to hire workers, in, you know, uh, it's, which is nothing more than other input of production. On the other hand, now unemployment is at 20%. So as you can see, we have about from six and a half to 20%, about 13 point, is that right? No, about 12.5, no, 13.5, about 13.5% of the people out of work in the economy today, you know, is as a result of the cyclical unemployment, and that is not natural. That is not natural. So when the government intervenes in the economy, this is the unemployment that we're trying to combat. This is the one that we want to erase. For example, the seasonal, well, there's nothing we can do about the seasons of the year. That's natural. The frictional, well, we can just probably help individuals to, to have access to information uh, boards, you know, uh, guide them into, in, into places to look for jobs like, you know, job.com or things like that. The structural, we can probably do a little bit about this if we can retrain people. Right? But this one is the one, the cyclical is the one that is the evil type of unemployment. And that's the big one that the government is really concerned. Okay. Any questions? No? Okay, again, it's a very, very simple chapter. We're trying to understand the different types of unemployment. Okay, so then at full employment, we mean that we have people out of work, but we don't have any cyclical unemployment. We don't have any cyclical unemployment. So then seasonal unemployment is the unemployment due to the seasons, changes in employment, right? Frictional is brief periods of unemployment because people are moving between jobs or in the labor market, right? In other words, there are jobs for them. <clears throat> people have the skills. They just simply have to match them. Frictional unemployed tend to be people out of work for a very short period of time. And again, that is natural, it's normal. The structural is unemployment caused by mismatch between the skills and the job seekers. In other words, there are no skills, or the people's skills are no longer in need, right? Uh, for example, as the economy changes, now we become a more technologically, uh, I guess, center economy. So individuals that have no college education or individuals that do not know how to use computers probably will have a hard job to find a job, right? So again, that's the structural unemployed, right? The cyclical unemployed is the unemployment as a result of declines in economic activity. People are not buying, companies are not producing, companies are not producing, they have to let go of workers. So then what will happen is we have excess supply of workers who are not going to be able to find jobs simply because the economy is contracting and no companies are hiring people. So then the only way we can get rid of cyclical unemployment is for the economy to grow as fast as the labor to avoid cyclical unemployment. Uh, I don't know if you have been following the news, but President Trump yesterday he signed a bill. Anybody know what the bill that he, that he signed? He signed a bill to decrease deregulations of certain companies, right? Like in other words, you don't have to comply with these laws. And the idea is that it will be easy for companies just simply to continue to, <clears throat> to produce without having to comply with government regulations. And again, the reason is because at this point we're de desperately, desperately, trying to deal with the issue of cyclical unemployment, a very serious situation. Okay, now, if unemployment becomes very small, 
if unemployment becomes very small, that means that most people are actually working, then one of the problems of having a very low levels of unemployment is that that's going to move us towards an inflationary flashpoint, which simply means it's going to put pressure on inflation to appear. So low levels of unemployment creates inflation. In reality, we know that there's a trade-off between inflation and unemployment. When unemployment increases, when unemployment increases, prices tend to come down. So then we have high unemployment, low inflation. Now, why do prices come down? Well, because if nobody's buying, companies have no choice, they have to reduce the prices. On the other hand, if everybody's working, everybody has income, everybody's buying, and if everybody's buying, the demand increases and prices are going to go up. So again, full employment, it simply means that we have an unemployment rate between four and now these numbers have changed. It's between four to six and a half percent. So if we have between four and six and a half percent, then we are at full employment. Again, it's a repetition of what I already told you. Now, some of the people that they actually classify by structural unemployment, in most cases, they're unemployed simply because society has changed. And the skills that these people possess, they are no longer valuable. When I was at Lee 40 years ago, uh, in my business classes, I took typing, typing classes. Dr. Echoes, some of you probably remember Dr. Echoes. Dr. Echoes was my typing professor. Why? Well, because companies at that point, all the communication that was done was done by mail and you have to type eight letters. And girls, mostly females, and for some reason they wanted to be secretaries. So females went out to school to learn how to type. And if you can type 120 words per minute, I mean, there was a high demand for you. I mean, my rate, I still remember, I used to type 36 words per minute. Now, which that means that I really suck. You know, 36 words per minute, and out of those 36 words, probably 25 of them were misspells. So, I mean, I was horrible at typing, right? I mean, they used to teach us typing by putting the keyboard, and they put a, a towel over the top and you have to type letters without looking at the keyboards. So I learned something. And like I said, some people became very good at that. Well, even if you were really good at that, well, good luck because companies don't hire people on how fast they type now. Because now you don't even have to type to be able to write the letter. You can dictate the letter and you know, technology will check your spelling and your phrases and things like that. Okay, so this is the structural unemployed. Okay, what else? Uh, again, the natural rate of unemployment is what is natural, which is the unemployment rate as a result of frictional, structural, and seasonal, okay? Now, at this point, ma many people complain that one of the reasons why we have a lot of unemployment is because American companies are beginning to move jobs abroad. They are involved in outsourcing. The company closes the plant, they move to China, they move to Costa Rica, they move to South Africa, right? And they create unemployment in the United States. Well, let me tell you something this. Let me tell you something. For the first time in our history, you know, outsourcing, well, outsourcing is a two-way street. But for the first time in our history, we have now more insourcing than outsourcing. Which simply means we have more foreign companies coming to the United States Right? They close their plans back in the countries, then American companies moving to another countries. Why is it that foreign companies are moving to the United States? Well, because the market is here. Most foreign companies sell to the United States. Remember, the United States is 5% of the world population, but we consume 25% that the planet produces. So the market is here for most companies. Japanese car manufacturers, they sell most of the cars in the United States. German car manufacturers sell most of the cars in Germany. British car manufacturers sell more of the cars in, in the United States. You know, so as a result of this, then these companies have moved the production plant to the United States because they can produce it actually cheaper because the American labor force is very inexpensive, right? And also because by doing that, they actually save in transportation costs. You know, the transportation cost for, for a car from Japan to the United States, the average cost is $700. Now, 
In other words, the Japanese company makes the car in Japan, and then they put it on a car, from a car they put it to the port, and from the port they put it on a, you know, on a carrier, a boat, that is going to bring it you know, two weeks sailing across the ocean, and the cost of transportation is about $700. So if the company moves in producing United States, boom, they reduce that $700 in production cost for the car, and they become more competitive, okay? Again, outsourcing takes place because of cheaper labor, uh, low cost, high speed of communications, but outsourcing is a two-way street, and a lot of foreigners are actually moving to the United States. Right? And again, for the first time in our history, we have more insourcing than outsourcing. And again, this is how world trade works. People move to places where they can do something better, cheaper, less expensive. Right? And this is the end of the chapter, guys. Very simple chapter, very simple chapter. The classifications of unemployment, the human cost of unemployment, how do we measure unemployment, what is the problem, the way we measure unemployment, what can we do about unemployment. So we are dealing with serious macroeconomic issues. And we have stopped the class. Let me stop the recording.